change our focus from a historical perspective more to a contemporary one. And I, I want to say, and I feel like our next speaker is uh, perfectly qualified to speak to this point, that the reason I really wanted this movement to be called Lean Startup versus something else, and people complain about that choice of phraseology all the time. If you have a better suggestion, please do email me. Uh, but in the meantime, why I think it's really important is that the kinds of organizations that we start now, remember I talked yesterday about accountability, process, culture, people in that order? Uh, you can see those elements in the Numi story, I feel like, really well. Uh, the commitment to try and create something of lasting value. That's been kind of our theme over the last two days. So if we're going to start with MVPs and experiments, we all have the obligation, no matter what kind of entrepreneur we are, to ask what kind of company are we building and what do we want it to grow into? And I think we all can hope uh, and aspire to grow into a company uh, like Toyota and to build a learning organization. Now, uh, then our next speaker has been one of the earliest of early adopters of Lean Startup. I mean, it's cool now, but it was not always that way. And there was uh, very few people who uh, had the insight to say, wait a minute, this is something uh, that is going to be important. And so our next speaker uh, has written uh, two books that I think many of you will have read. One, The Entrepreneur's Guide to Customer Development, and more recently, a book called The Lean Entrepreneur. It really is a field book, a handbook for how to do exactly the kinds of things we are talking about now. I'm very proud to say uh, it was a New York Times bestseller. Please welcome Patrick Vlaskovitz. Thank you, Eric. It was 1948, and Earl Tupper was a frustrated man. He had invented a brilliant alternative to the heavy ceramic dishware that Americans were used to. His Wonder Bowl was lightweight, airtight, and durable. He'd won design awards, and he'd gotten it into major department stores and hardware stores the places where people bought dishware in 1948. Yet no one was buying. What was wrong with Earl Tupper's wonderful idea? Compared to a lot of modern startups, he was a huge success. He had a great product, a high-quality manufacturing process, and retail distribution. Yet people weren't buying. What was Earl doing wrong? Before we can answer those questions, let me ask you guys. Why is contour cameras out of business while GoPro absolutely dominates the action camera market? Why isn't anyone in this room using Everpix to organize and store your photos? And why have you ever heard of letsbuyit.com but probably have 17 unused Groupons in your email inbox? Allow me to introduce to you the graveyard of good ideas. All the ideas I met, just mentioned were brilliant ideas. They should have succeeded. In fact, they got pretty close. They had an idea, had a team, and brought a product to market. We all know how hard it is to get funded, how hard it is to convince investors that your idea is the one that will break through, and the competition is fiercer every day. Colleges across the country, new would-be entrepreneurs are emerging, getting excited about things like Lean Startup. And there are now more than 9,000 professors teaching entrepreneurship, according to the Kauffman Foundation. And more than 500 innovation centers and startup accelerators just at colleges across the country. So if you manage to get even one person behind your idea, you're doing pretty good. And yet, I think we can agree, most startups fail. Good data on the success rates of startups is hard to come by, but failure is the, the, is the most likely outcome. So let's be honest. It's incredibly difficult to sell the world a good idea. Even penicillin, even penicillin effectively failed as an idea before it was successful. Contrary to popular belief, Alexander Fleming didn't discover penicillin in September of 1928 the antibiotic effects of penicillin had been independently discovered multiple times, multiple times, 
before Fleming's accidental rediscovery in the basement of St. Mary's Hospital of London. So if penicillin, which is credited with saving more than 100 million lives during the 20th century, didn't immediately go viral, <laughs> what hope is there for your idea? And yet, some innovations do succeed. What is the secret that successful innovators know that perhaps the rest of us don't? Netflix succeeded. After struggling through the recession of 2001, the Netflix team added free Netflix coupons to the holiday gift of the season, the $99 DVD player. And with that, Netflix's growth trajectory radically transformed. Dropbox succeeded. After a tragically unsuccessful pay-per-click campaign, the Dropbox team shifted gears, departed from best practices for online marketing, and engineered a now legendary two-sided incentive program which has probably been copied by every startup known to man since. So it's common in these stories of successful innovation is something that Marshall McLuhan pointed out in 1964. Namely, the medium is the message. How your customers learn about your product is part of your product. How your customers get access to your product is part of your product. How your customers experience the context of your product is part of your product development. The medium itself is the message. McLuhan explained it this way. Imagine you're sitting in a neighborhood bar with your best friend sharing a few beers. Your best friend turns to you and says, crime is up. You shrug your shoulders, and you finish your beer. Now imagine you're sitting at the dinner table with your spouse and your 1.8 kids. You're watching CNN, and Anderson Cooper says, crime is up in your neighborhood. How do you feel about that now? It feels different. It feels more personal, doesn't it? Because context matters. So it's not enough to actually have an innovative product as tough as that is. And in fact, the more, I believe the more innovative your product is, the more innovative your idea is, the more innovative your medium has to be. And the way you do that is by co-evolving the medium and the message. Like the orchid and the orchid fly to produce a symbiotic relationship. It worked for Earl Tupper. Remember how frustrated he was? Earl Tupper, Earl Tupper's wonderful idea didn't, bring, didn't find itself into, Ameri into millions of American kitchens until he met a woman named Brownie Wise. Brownie Wise told Earl that she was selling tons and tons of Tupperware by inviting, inviting her friends over and showing them how to use it by manufacturing the context. Tupperware by itself was a pretty cool invention. But it didn't become a household name until Brownie Wise invented the Tupperware party. Brownie Wise was the original growth hacker. So, how do we think about new mediums? Well, it's pretty clear. There's only a few ways to get one. You either find one, you create one, or you hijack an existing one. And typically, they follow a four-stage process, a four-stage sequence that uh, appears, to be, uh, appears to be universal. Number one, you have the Wild West stage. This is where growth hackers enter the picture. So here you have people connecting in new interesting ways. Think Facebook circa 2009. 
Number two, you have the hockey stick stage. One actor emerges to, to uh, harvest the fruits of these interactions and yield exponential growth. This is Zynga in 2009. Three, the tragedy of the commons. Multiple actors now converge on the same channel, the same medium, growth drops. These are the Zynga clones that also emerged in 2009 on the Facebook ecosystem. And then four, the governance stage. Where typically, where existing innovation, where sustaining innovation typically acts. The medium owner now applies governance. Growth drops, it's now predictable, but more costly, no longer exponential. Growth hackers have now exited the building. I believe this is something actually all great innovators understand and intuit naturally. This is why you don't go to a sprawling, hot, annoying, disgusting dealership to buy a Tesla. You go to a beautiful temple of Tesla at your, at your local fashion mall. Consider that about two weeks ago, Chinese smartphone manufacturer Xiaomi sold 150,000 units of its latest flagship device, the Mi 3, in under 10 minutes, using only a chat application favored by Chinese teenagers. 150,000 units in 10 minutes. This is as if Samsung had sold millions of phones using only Twitter. Now, this may sound like work you can farm out to a marketing team, but I, I, really, I really urge you to incorporate this into your product development process. Do with the things that Eric and Steve talk about, the customer development, the lean startup, and figure out what is the appropriate medium to get the hockey stick-like growth you're looking for. Thank you.